bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, and the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. And welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled Pediatric Concussion, New Guidelines for Optimal Care. Uh, but before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, you may have noticed in our intro, for those of you who are regular viewers, uh, we do uh, acknowledge our uh, knowledge translation partners, and those are organizations that have specifically provided us with funding that allows us to uh, run our knowledge translation program. And we have a new logo there that was not, uh, we haven't had time, we've had time to add the logo to the intro, but not to the to the voice recording. So uh, we're very excited to welcome uh, CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, as one of our, as our newest uh, KT partners. So We'll be sure to add them to the fully add them to the intro coming up, but we certainly appreciate their support, which allows and then those are the organizations and, and their support allows us to keep these webinars going on a weekly basis and to do it for without having to charge people for uh, for attending. So we do appreciate those uh, organizations that support us in that way. We also want to make sure that everyone is aware of the upcoming uh, CAFC annual conference this year in Calgary, Alberta, from October 19th to the 21st. It is almost literally right around the corner. Many of us will be heading out there, uh, I think, uh, for some preliminary meetings a week from Thursday. So it literally is around the corner, but there is still lots of opportunity to uh, to uh, register, and, uh, and hopefully you can join us out there. The theme is Climbing Mountains, Leadership and Resilience in Pediatric Healthcare. And we have a great lineup of speakers, then, but we also have, have included uh, some a closing keynote speaker from local hometown hero from Calgary and country superstar, Paul Brandt. So it'll be a former pediatric nurse, for those of you who don't know, that he's also uh, started out his career as a, as a nurse at the Alberta Children's Hospital. So it's going to be a great conference, and we hope, uh, hope to see uh, lots of you out there. As always, we will take uh, questions at various times throughout the webinar, so I encourage you to type questions into the question box uh, that uh, is in the control panel that usually appears on the right-hand side of your screen. And as I said, type them in as you think of them. Don't feel you have to wait until we ask for questions. We'll, it's always nice to have a nice list of questions ready so that we can present them to, the, to, the, uh, to our presenters uh, whenever they're ready to accept any questions. You are also free to come and go from the session uh, if you like. It doesn't interrupt the session. And we do record the entire webinar so that you can always go back and catch up on any pieces that you might have missed, whether you have to miss the end or any part in the middle. You can always go back to that recording. The, rec the recording and any other resources or documents provided to us by our presenters will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange, the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org. It usually takes a couple of days to get that information up, but you will the person registered or the email that's registered uh, for the webinar will receive a, an automatic message with a direct link that will take you straight to the to the page where all of this information, including the uh, audio visual recording. Um, and the CAN does also provide an opportunity for comments for registered users at the bottom of each page. So we encourage you to uh, continue the discussion following the presentation and uh, post any other information or links or comments that you think might be relevant uh, to this session. So uh, without any further ado, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome our speakers and to introduce this topic. Um, and certainly a timely topic. This is uh, information that's sort of relatively hot off the press, as hot as it can be by the time it gets published and we finally get speakers and dates and everything in the calendar. But this is very new information and very relevant, considering as a parent of two kids uh, that have just started their hockey season this year, the topic of concussions is always top of mind as you watch your kids uh, screaming around on the ice. Um, but it's my pleasure to welcome two, uh, two of the folks who have brought, to, who have led uh, the development of these new concussion guidelines. We have uh, Nick Reed, uh, from, uh, who's a, an occupational therapist and clinician scientist from the Blurview Research Institute at Holland Blurview Kids Rehab Hospital, where he's, he has been involved in the development and implementation of concussion clinical services and, and a research program. And we also have Dr. Sarah Reed, uh, who's a pedi uh, pediatric emergency physician at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and she's also an assistant professor in the departments of pediatric and um, pediatrics and emergency medicine at the University of Ottawa, and the director of continuing Med medical education in the Department of Pediatrics. And despite their names being both being Reed, I don't you can notice that they are spelled differently, so I don't believe there's any relation. But uh, but it is my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to you, uh, Dr. Reed, to kick this off. Great, thank you so much, Doug, for the introduction. 
Um, we are delighted to be here today to introduce these new concussion guidelines specifically for pediatrics. And of course we had to choose a, a picture of the most famous concussion to date, we think. Um, but we also have to remember that Sidney Crosby was a little guy at one point, and uh, that's really what we're going to be talking about. How can we protect our kids who are involved in sport and all their other activities from this very common and can uh, potentially significant injury? Uh, and I'll pass it over to Nick for the first little uh, bit of our presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I think sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> there we go. Is that okay? That's so there's Sydney. <laughs> and uh, there he is as a little kid. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to walk us right through the uh, the presentation here, get us going. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be talking with all of you today and sharing these, uh, as, as Doug mentioned, hot off the press guidelines on uh, managing and diagnosing pediatric concussion. Um, just trying to advance the slide here. So first and foremost, I wanted to speak to our disclosure. So no financial or non-financial interest to disclose here for both Sarah and myself. Uh, but we did want to disclose that we're thrilled to be talking to you today. So um, hopefully you get a lot out of this session and that you enjoy it. Uh, as far as our objectives today, really what we want you all to walk away with is the ability to recognize and diagnose concussion in, a, in pediatric patients. Um, some information around counseling parents and children effectively regarding return to learn and return to play. Uh, and for us, this is a big one. So I know in the sport world, this idea of returning to activity and returning to, to sport has always been at the forefront. But we do want to make sure that this idea of return to learn is, is definitely a priority and something that we're all considering when managing this injury. And further, we want you to be able to use and access recommended tools to assess, manage, and counsel children with concussions. So the intention today is to provide you with uh, tools and resources from our hot off the press guidelines for diagnosing and managing pediatric concussion funded by the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. And just make sure you can build your toolbox and you have an idea of what these guidelines are, what they entail, and how you can use them effectively within your own networks and, uh, and communities. So as far as our agenda today, oh, one too far. We're going to speak to what is a concussion in general, just to give you a little bit of background information. And then why do we even think about concussion in youth? Why is this something that we're, we're on the phone today, um, that we're all attending this webinar today, and that all of us in our respective facilities are, are uh, considering within our, the pediatric population? We'll speak to the signs and symptoms of concussion uh, and some of the specific aspects around clinical management of the injury. And again, as I mentioned, really try to direct you towards some fantastic resources that you can access free of charge uh, that can really benefit your, your population that you work with. And finally, we hope to have lots of time for some questions. And as Doug said, please do um, type in those questions uh, throughout the presentation and hopefully we have uh, some great discussion towards the end. So, Getting into this, we wanted to try and get a sense of, of our audience and see what we're working with here and try and direct our message uh, to you to the best of our ability so that you get the most you can out of this session. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you can, is, is click on the options below. So who do we have in our audience today? Uh, healthcare providers, researchers, administrators, parents, teachers, or coaches. And if you could take a moment to, to click um, one of those options, that would be fantastic for us and it would help us um, um, tailor our message to the best of our ability today. So uh, as uh, Nick said, uh, just type, just click on the screen um, to uh, uh, make your selection on the screen. And if you do, if, if you did want to select other, um, that's uh, where you can just type uh, what you are uh, into the question box. And that'll give us a sense uh, who else is out there other than those uh, selections that are listed on the screen. So I think we have uh, the results are in. And uh, certainly by far the audience is made up of healthcare practitioners or healthcare providers at 78%, followed by administrators, uh, followed by uh, researchers, and then a few parents out there as well. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for doing that. We really appreciate it. So, yeah, it looks like the majority of our audience, the large majority, is uh, healthcare practitioners. So um, that's fantastic. A lot of the details we're going to be speaking to are specific to the healthcare population to, to really improve and, and build your practice so that you can help these kids as best as possible. And for those of you out there that aren't healthcare practitioners, you're still going to get a lot out of this. And I think the tools are, are very multi-purpose and you can all access them and use them to your own advantage as well. 
So thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. So what is a concussion? Um, so in general, they you know, so the jargony definition is a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechanical forces. And really, what we're saying here is that your brain sits inside the skull, protected by uh, what might be considered sort of a jello mold that provides some protection, some absorption against force. Uh, and if there's any force to the head or to the body that's going to cause that brain to move in, around inside the skull, there's the potential for that brain to, to hit up against the skull and have a, a direct sort of localized injury. Uh, but also thinking about the two hemispheres, so the shearing between the two hemispheres of our brain, um, some twisting and shearing is going to cause those blood vessels and connective tissue to, to break and to, to be damaged to some extent, which could cause for a more uh, diffuse injury throughout the brain, which in, in some situations causes a longer recovery. So if we all think of that Sidney Crosby picture at the start of the presentation, and we remember back to that clip of his concussion that we saw many, many times, uh, we did see him sort of rotating on an axis, or so a rotational acceleration of, of that head and body. And uh, when that occurs, you know, that's when we are seeing that shearing throughout the brain. Despite sort of the, the more scientific definition, I like to break it down, keep it simple for the kids and the families that we're working with, and really call concussion the invisible injury. So when we think about general injuries that, that kids may experience, broken arms, sprained ankles, they're very visible. We can get a real sense that that young person is injured, that they're having difficulty, there may be some bruising or a cast. Um, so if this young person walks into a classroom, you know, maybe they won't have to write that test today because they have that cast on. Or maybe they don't need to participate in gym class today because that ankle just isn't looking great. But when it comes to a concussion, it's a little more difficult to determine what's going on inside that skull. Um, so it's extremely invisible. And this young guy, potentially, you know, he looks from the outside, he's looking fairly normal, um, but what could be going on inside that skull, inside that brain is, uh, is a lot of damage that he, uh, he's definitely dealing with and that's going to cause some functional issues for him throughout his day. So I alluded to this already, but a concussion, it can be caused by a direct blow to the head, but also the face, neck, or anywhere on that body. So any opportunity for that brain to move around inside the skull, there's the potential for a concussion to occur. We do know the injury resolves spontaneously, and that it's more of a functional disturbance than, than anything else. Um, and it may or may not involve loss of consciousness. So this is one of those cultural uh, myths that we were trying, we're a bit up against in the sport community, but it doesn't have to be that big knockout blow impact that's causing these injuries. These concussions can occur uh, in many different ways. Uh, and even, you know, from my own experience coaching lacrosse and being involved in, in many different sports, you know, and, and also knowing what I know and being, should be able to identify concussions, sometimes they're missed because these injuries aren't necessarily uh, resulting from massive impacts that we'd all be paying attention to. We do know as well that generally um, when we have a concussion, the neuroimaging is going to be normal. And again, that relates back to this idea of it being a more functional injury. So before I pass it over to, to Sarah to continue to, to speak around some of the background of concussion, I just want to pull the audience again here just to get a bit of information from you uh, and even for you guys to take a look at uh, who else is in the audience and the prevalence of this injury. So if you could take a moment and click either yes or no, have you experienced a concussion or a possible concussion yourself? Hi. I don't know if you're surprised by these results, but I think I am a little bit surprised. 50% of the people in the audience have said yes. Okay. So generally, this is this is in line with what I typically see in, with community talks, where rather than polling on the computer, we get sort of the old-fashioned raise your hand to get a sense of the uh, the prevalence of the injury. But 50% of us, that, that's, that's quite a large number. Um, so you, a lot of you have experienced that injury, and you sort of know what we're talking about around these signs and symptoms. Uh, the next line of questioning is getting at sort of within your professional world, um, what type of, you know, involvement have you had with this, this injury? So we want to ask you to, to click the option, have you treated a youth who has experienced a concussion? Uh, yes in the last week, yes in the last month, yes in the last year, or not at all. And 29% have said yes in the last week, 12% in the last have said yes in the last month, 38% yes in the last year, and only 20% have said no, not at all. Okay, so we can see from these results that based on our audience today, and again, mostly healthcare pr practitioners, we are seeing a, a high prevalence of, of treating this injury. So the bottom line um, with this line of questioning is just to get a sense that this injury is happening, 
both to ourselves but also within our, our professional world. And it's something that I think we all need to start to um, build our toolbox, build our experiences, build our approach to managing this injury, and, and as well get on the same page. So that's the intention of today, and we hope that, uh, that you get a lot out of it. So I'm going to pass it over to Sarah now to speak to uh, some of the pathophysiology around concussion. Great. Thanks, Nick. So uh, let me just move. So yeah, so we're just going to talk a little bit about pathophysiology. And I, I think we've kind of alluded to this already, that um, the injuries caused by this direct blow to the head, face, or and as Nick mentioned, to even anywhere on the body with that secondary force transmitted up to the head. And this is the sort of thing that I think about when I'm my husband's watching Monday Night Football, um, you know, watching these kind of forces um, that those players are, are submitting their bodies to. Um, and as mentioned, there's this acceleration, deceleration, and probably very importantly, a rotation of the head with the brain inside the skull moving as well that um, ends up giving us some compressive uh, tensile and shearing forces on um, the brain itself. And this is the cause of that functional disturbance that we were alluding to before. And so what's happening on kind of... Uh, cellular level, this is why, you know, on an MRI or a CT scan, the, the scanning that we have that's available routinely in the hospital, we don't see um, any changes, but there certainly are lots of things happening down in the cells in the brain tissue itself. Um, and we won't belabor this, but suffice it to say that these um, brain cells and axons are not happy. Um, there's a lot of derangements happening with glucose, with ions, with um, our neurotransmitters. Um, and particularly a change in our cerebral blood flow. Um, and these changes can happen immediately, can evolve over the first couple of days after the injury, and they may well last for weeks to months as the brain recovers from the concussion. Um, and so when we think about what's happening kind of in those cells after the injury, one way of thinking about it is the problem is that there's an energy crisis. Um, in order for the brain to get better and back to its homeostatic happy state, um, ATP is required, ATP being um, a very important energy source in the body. Um, and we know that post-concussion, cerebral blood flow is really decreased post-injury. And so what we end up, and, and the blood flow is what's going to deliver the ATP to the areas that need to heal. And so what we end up with in the concussed patient is a mismatch between supply and demand for ATP. And this is a proposed mechanism for why we sometimes have prolonged symptoms. Um, and so what we are, are trying to do when we advocate for rest is to get that demand down so that we can get the supply and demand of ATP or that energy source that's gonna help the brain to heal back into balance. So if we move or shift now, just I think we got a sense from our audience even that there's a significant number of people walking around that have experienced this injury. When we speak specifically about um, pediatrics, where I work in the CHEO emergency department in Ottawa, um, we see 70,000 kids a year and about 900 cases a year of concussion. So about one in 70 patients that we see in our eMERGE has a concussion. And I, I must say personally that you know, every every week I work, I would see a kid with concussion, at least one. When we look at U.S. data, all comers, so all ages, up to, you know, almost 4 million mild traumatic brain injuries, and that is um, another term that could be used concurrently with concussion um, per year. We know that our high-risk sports include things like hockey, football, soccer, horseback riding, cycling, and snowboarding. And I would say probably in my experience, hockey would be number one, and that's probably related to the fact that so many kids are involved in that sport. What we also know is that this is an injury that's underreported and underrecognized. And so when we talk about numbers, we know that they're probably higher. So I'll just pass it over to Nick to discuss uh, the issues related to concussion and youth. So to build on what Sarah was mentioning, uh, we do know that there's a lot of kids participating in organized sports in this country. Um, and we do know that concussion, when it comes to youth participating in organized sports, it, there's a higher likelihood of having this injury. So even six times more likely to experience a concussion in organized sports and other leisure activities. 
based on the limited research data, we know that concussion is one of the most specific, common specific injuries in hockey. And I think although we do speak a lot about hockey when it comes to concussion and from the research that's been uh, produced to date, we do need to expand our horizons. At least you know, we're seeing it clinically and as uh, Sarah mentioned, there's a lot of different uh, young people coming into emergency departments and into my uh, rehabilitation clinic as well um, that participate in many different sports or may have had their injury in, in other activities, tobogganing, horsing around with friends, whatever it may be. Um, so we do need to expand our research horizons to, to try to capture the incidence rates across different sports and activities. But to date, hockey, you know, as we all know in Canada, somewhat lives and breathes. So a lot of the data that I speak to here in these slides are, are related to that sport. Uh, we do see that in uh, in some of our previous research in our concussion research center at Holland Bloorview in Toronto and at the University of Toronto, uh, we see about a 10 to 15 percent annual concussion rate in youth athletes, and the majority again of these athletes are hockey players. So to put that into context, um, so we have a, a pretty happy hockey team. So any of those uh, on the call today that are involved in in hockey or their their families are involved in hockey. It's sort of the preseason, things are getting ready to roll. Um, so same thing with this group. So they just were in a preseason tournament, they scored an overtime winner, everyone's pretty happy. Uh, but a little morbidly, what I'm going to do is uh, circle the, the heads of the players that are going to go on and experience a concussion this season. So on every team, based on that 10 to 15 percent concussion rate, we're going to see two to three players every season experiencing a concussion. Um, so the bottom line is that this injury is definitely happening and it's something that we all want to start to to pay more attention to in our, in our personal lives, but I think specifically for all of us in our professional lives so that we have the tools and resources to help these young kids manage their injury and uh, not stop playing their sport, but get back to playing their sport um, to the best of their ability and, uh, and to do so in a safe way. So we really do want to encourage activity and physical activity and continuing uh, participating in, in sport and other physical activity endeavors, uh, but we want to make sure that we have the tools and practices in place for, uh, for all these kids to manage their injury appropriately. So specifically to kids, we know concussion is definitely a common injury in children and teens as we showed by some of those statistics. Um, and we also know that children and teens take longer to get better. Um, so for the most part, with some good education, good management strategies, a lot of these children and teens are, gonna, are going to recover quite well um, and, and progress to uh, re-engaging into their daily activities. But we do know that within this population specifically, especially compared to adults, we can see longer recovery times and the need for a conservative approach is even higher when, when dealing with returning to activities. We do know that that immature brain is more vulnerable to diffuse injury and disruption of that autoregulation. And we know that the effects of concussion can be cumulative. So you know, the chance of having a prolonged recovery from your second concussion and third concussion and fourth concussion are, are quite a bit higher. And that's something we want to make sure that we're aware of as healthcare professionals uh, and something that we can counsel our, our patients and their families on to make sure that they have all the details and information they need to really manage this injury. So as I alluded to, pediatric concussion, more so than, than I would argue within the adult side of things, must be managed conservatively. And we need to apply strategies and guidelines uh, in a consistent way in order to do this across the board, across our country, and across the world. So I want to move us into something a little more uh, based in reality, so a bit of a case study, or at least as, as much of reality as we can, uh, we can create over, uh, over a teleconference. Um, but this is Jack, so he's an 11-year-old, previously healthy boy, competitive hockey player, uh, and in one of his games he collided with another player. Uh, he complains of a headache, nausea, dizziness, and he can't remember the event. So he comes to see us in our clinics, and uh, what are we going to do next? So the first step here is we're going to be making that diagnosis. And in order to make that diagnosis, we're going to be relying, uh, at least initially, on the report of post-concussion symptoms. So when it comes to these symptoms, it's, they're extremely broad and they're also nonspecific. So it's not a, you know, a perfect science in identifying these uh, the concussion and, and managing that diagnosis, but using the tools that we're going to walk you through today, as well as keeping in mind 
of what symptoms may occur as a result of a concussion, we can start to put the pieces together and, and hopefully diagnose this injury efficiently and help these kids to the best of our ability. Um, so you can see we have some physical signs and symptoms, some behavioral changes, uh, cognitive impairment, and also a big factor is sleep disturbances. Um, especially in the pediatric population and the adolescent teen population, you know, we have these symptoms of, of irritability, emotional um, issues, sadness, anxiety. These are things that we really want to be aware of. And I think more, more times than I would like to see, and I'm sure all of us would like to see, these symptoms just get passed off as, you know, this is just being a teenager and this is a part of their day-to-day their -day mood. But we really want to make sure that we're, we're cluing into these symptoms and managing them as best we can. What we like to say when it comes to diagnosing a concussion is even if there's just one of these symptoms, uh, we want to treat this, uh, this potential injury um, as if it was a concussion and put the practices in place to make sure it's managed properly. And we also know that these symptoms, um, you know, they can last for short periods of time, minutes or hours, but they can last for days and, and in some cases for very prolonged periods of time. The next slide I want to show you, and it's a little bit busy, um, this is one of the checklists that we would generally use in our clinics um, in order to get a sense of what signs and symptoms are occurring within the child. Uh, and the only reason I put this up is to, again, show you the breadth of these symptoms, um, that it isn't just the headache or it isn't just feeling nauseous, uh, as we may have thought previously, but there's a whole lot going on here. And if we don't ask um, how that young person is feeling and create an environment where they can really report these symptoms and give us a sense of how the, the brain and body is reacting to that potential injury, um, th then we won't know. So we really need to make sure that we're taking a broad approach uh, and, and hoping that that young person and their family uh, can be really honest with us on how, that, on how they are feeling. A few take-home points around these signs and symptoms to summarize before I pass it back over to Sarah. Um, are related to, and I think I have a bit of delay on my slides here. Hopefully you guys can see them. Oh, sorry about that. So these signs and symptoms, we want to make sure that everyone's aware that every injury is different. Um, so this can be within individuals and also between individuals. So oftentimes I'll hear from parents uh, that come into my clinic or even that I work with in the community from a coaching perspective um, say to me, well, you know, there was a pretty significant impact, but and when Johnny had his concussion two years ago, he had a headache and he was dizzy. And this time, he didn't have any of those symptoms. He was just feeling you know, a little bit foggy and, and maybe a bit more irritable. Um, so we want to be sure that we're looking at all symptoms in all situations and not just relying on um, what may have occurred in the past for that individual or, or maybe someone else that we know. We do know those symptoms may not appear right away. Um, so just like if you're, you, you're playing some pickup soccer and you tweak your ankle, uh, you keep on playing, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, and it's when you're in the shower standing up that you really feel the pain and, that, and the significance of that injury. Uh, the brain is no different. So those symptoms may not appear right away. So we want to make sure there is constant dialogue uh, with, the, with the youth and their families to make sure that we are recognizing symptoms when they do finally appear. We do know that these signs and symptoms may be missed early on, uh, so it's really a team approach here. And us as healthcare providers, we, we play an important role here. We need to make sure that we're giving the right education, the right information, so that we can pick up these, these symptoms and we can provide our families that we work with and the youth themselves with the tools necessary to do that. Uh, and as I said before, even one symptom we want to treat as a concussion and, uh, and really be conservative in our approach to management. So I'm going to pass it back over to Sarah, and she's going to speak to um, some of the ideas around assessment and really get into this, these guidelines that have been developed that I think you can all take full advantage of uh, within your own practices. Great. Thanks, Nick. So yeah, we're going to move on to talking about how to do a systematic assessment of a child or youth with concussion and, and specifically showing you screenshots of the guidelines. So just to remind us, um, the ONF, or Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, funded um, the development of these specific pediatric guidelines, and they are available at the ONF website, www.onf.org. Um, and they were developed over two years with an international panel of experts reviewing over 4,000 studies related to concussion and coming up with the best um, evidence uh, in 2014. Um, and 
accumulating the tools that they felt were the best available, and they're all available in this one comprehensive document. So I would really encourage you to take a look if you're interested in this subject and you're treating patients with concussion in your practice. Um, but today we're going to walk you through some, just some of what's available um, in that document. So when we're talking about what the patient is like on presentation, um, there's a few things that we need to do. Um, particularly around making sure that there's not a more significant injury. And so, of course, we need to assess and treat any physical, cognitive, or neurological deficits that are identified through the physical examination and the history. We need to make sure um, that the child is not at risk for having a significant intracranial injury that would require a CT to rule out. Um, we would consider having the patient admitted or observed if they have concerning symptoms. We want to treat their pain, which is generally related to headache. We want to prescribe our physical and cognitive rest. And we're going to discharge them home, hopefully in good condition, with great instructions to their family as to what they're going to be looking for over the next few days to weeks as they recover. So let's just go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, as usual, we're going to start taking a history and um, we're going to ask what happened. We want to know what the mechanism of injury is. We want to know whether there was a loss of consciousness, if the child or adolescent remembers the event, remembers events leading up to it and after what happened. Uh, we want to know what their symptoms are and, and Nick showed uh, a nice listing of all the symptoms that may be issues that we need to ask about. And how are those symptoms? Are they, are they improving? Are they staying the same? Are they worsening? Uh, if they were involved in, in sport, were they wearing protective equipment? Then we want to get it at a little bit more about what's happened in the past. So we want to know about previous concussions. Uh, Nick already alluded to the fact that that may put the, uh, the child at risk of having a harder time getting better. Um, and so we want to know how many, when they were, how severe were they, how long did it take them to get back to school or to play? What were their symptoms last time? Um, and then this third point disproportionate uh, impact versus symptom severity. What we're trying to get at there is asking whether it's getting easier for this kid to get a concussion. So maybe they had a very significant impact um, that led to their first concussion. A year later, uh, they have another injury that happens just with uh, a fairly minor impact. And that would make us a bit more worried about that kid um, because it shows us that that brain is getting more susceptible to the injury. Um, and that's a child we're going to be watching really carefully as they recover. Um, and we're also going to be thinking about how we're going to counsel them about return to, pl to play and whether they need to think about whether the sport that they're involved in is uh, something they want to continue or should continue. We want to get at whether there's been any prior head, uh, neck, facial injuries. And that's, again, um, recognizing that this particular injury concussion is often under-recognized and, and maybe missed. And so if we ask about whether there have been any other significant injuries, we might get a sense of whether there was a concussion that was actually missed. And then the last point on this slide is just getting at uh, the past medical history of the, of the child, whether there's a history of headache or migraine, mental health issues like anxiety or depression, any learning disability or neurocognitive issues like ADHD or pre-existing sleep issues. Because we think, and there's ongoing research to delineate this a bit better, but we think that those um, comorbidities may um, cause the child to have a harder time getting better. And that might, that puts that child into sort of a higher risk group for having prolonged concussion symptoms. So this is a screenshot from the guidelines, and it just goes through to remind us what we need to assess at the bedside when we're doing our physical exam. And it's probably things that everyone's doing already, but there's a couple of things I wanted to highlight. We're going to be ruling out whether there's signs of a skull fracture, either a basal skull fracture or, or um, uh, a regular skull fracture um, related to a boggy hematoma. Um, we want to make sure that the C-spine is normal. We want to assess the TMJ uh, for range of motion and uh, tenderness and dislocation. We want to do some assessment of cognition because we know that that's a significant domain that can be affected in the concussed patient. We want to assess cranial nerves and, and they, um, the guidelines stress two, three, four, six, and seven for assessment. We want to do a motor and sensory screen. 
And for sure, we want to assess for balance because we know that postural instability is really common in patients who are concussed. So we decided to include the child SCAT-3 just as an example of one of the tools that it's included in this document. This, this is a, an assessment tool that has been um, endorsed by a lot of different sporting uh, organizations, as you can see there along the top, soccer, uh, International Hockey Foundation, the Olympics, etc. Um, and there's one for uh, this child SCAT-3 is for kids between 5 and 12, and then there's the adult or the older kids SCAT-3 um, that is from 13 onwards. And it just is um, a document that you can work through as a healthcare provider with your patient um, that can help to um, organize you to do your systematic assessment of the kid. Um, and so this is um, one of the tools that um, the guidelines decided to include because it does provide that um, a nice uh, systematic assessment. This particular tool is not um, officially validated but has been endorsed by the guidelines for use. So not to uh, go into too too much detail about the SCAT-3 um, but there is a at the beginning of the document there's some uh, room here to just uh, do a brief assessment of uh, the, the child in terms of their past medical history and getting at some of those comorbidities that we already talked about like migraine or neurocognitive issues, mental health issues. And then there is a symptom checklist and for the younger kids with this child SCAT-3, so the kids between 5 and 12, there's a this list that they would answer themselves on the Likert scale, um, 0 to 3, that you see there on the right hand side. And also a place for a parent to um, note their assessment for this young child. And this is something that a healthcare provider could consider do, having them do out in the waiting room. So we do recognize that there's lots of things to do at this initial appointment when you're doing your assessment, and time will be an issue. So this is something that certainly you could get the parent and child to do before you see them. And then the SCAT-3 does walk us through reminding that a cognitive assessment is important, looking at orientation and immediate memory, some concentration tasks, just reminding us to assess that crania, those um, that C-spine and reminding us to do the balance examination. The SCAT-3 doesn't expect you to remember exactly what you're supposed to do. The third page of the document gives very specific examples of how this is applied in the office, so really easy to um, really easy to follow instructions. We check coordination and this is a finger nose type examination and then we ask for a delayed recall. So we've asked them to remember five words um, on immediate recall right at the beginning of the cognitive assessment and then after we're finished our physical exam we ask for delayed recall. So again just remembering that assessment of cognition is something that we all need to do for our concussed patients, both at the initial assessment and then as they're recovering. So one of the other points that was listed um, in the guidelines in terms of the initial assessment would be to make sure that the child does not need a CT scan and the fact that on physical examination you've ruled out um, the presence of a more significant injury. So the Canadian Pediatric Society did publish an acute head injury, um, sorry, an acute head trauma position statement back in 2013, which is essentially a summary of uh, current evidence, the state of evidence in terms of um, acute head injury, specifically also giving direction about who needs a CT and who doesn't. Again, remembering that we are trying to minimize the exposure to radiation in these uh, developing brains that are a bit more radiosensitive. So they provide a table of absolute and relative indications for doing a CT and then I'm going to show you an algorithm that they derived as well. Um, clearly a patient who has a focal neurological deficit or signs of a skull fracture um, needs a CT scan. And then a list of relative indications um, that um, may direct you to do the CT. We'll go through the algorithm in a few in a, in a little bit more detail, but um, a Glasgow Coma Scale less than 14 at any time, significant, um, that would signify a little bit more of a significant injury. Um, GCS that doesn't get back to normal within two hours post-injury. A, a child who's deteriorating over um, the four to six hours post-injury. Again, signs of a basal skull fracture or a boggy scalp hematoma that can be often associated with an underlying skull, skull fracture. 
a serious mecha mechanism of injury, and so that's often um, related to the height of the fall um, or whether they were a passenger in a vehicle that had a significant impact. If they have persistent irritability, that has been something that has been uh, looked at in children less than two who are preverbal. Um, seizures at any time or obviously an underlying health concern like a coagulation disorder that would put them at risk of having a bleed. So on, in that uh, same document, the CPS document, this tool is available on the, um, as part of the guidelines. So this uh, algorithm has been included. We'll go through it in just a, a few steps here. But this is looking at children over two years of age with a history of an acute impact to the head and what your management should be. So obviously, if we start up in the left-hand corner, we're going to take a history and do our physical and neurological exam and determine our Glasgow Coma Scale. And what we're really talking about here are the children who have mild um, head injury kind of symptoms, so GCS of 14 to 15. And then we're going to move to the right. And the first um, listing to the right would be that we know that the GCS is 14 to 15. We move on and we find that the patient is asymptomatic and the exam is normal and their um, mechanism of injury is low risk. We rule out whether there's any other social or medical indication for admission and we discharge, okay? So that's, the, that's kind of the easy one, who looks well. The second row is when we have any of the following, like an abnormal mental status, i.e. they're not behaving normally or their neurological exam is abnormal or we suspect a skull fracture, then the recommendation really is to do a CT scan. And obviously if it's positive, we're talking to neurosurgery and the child's getting admitted to hospital. And then the third option, which is unfortunately often where we end up, is when it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So we've, um, this algorithm from the Canadian Pediatric Society recommends that if there's a history of an, a loss of consciousness or amnesia, confusion, lethargy or irritability, repeated or persistent vomiting, a severe or persistent headache, and a, a, an impact seizure, or at the physician's discretion, that the patient would at least be admitted, um, observed in the emergency department for four to six hours, and a CT scan would be considered. If the CT scan is done and it's normal, the pa and the patient's symptoms have improved, they would be discharged home. If the patient improves over the course of the observation, often the CT scan is avoided, and they would go home with good instructions. And this is often where we find the concussed patient. I would say in our practice, in our emergency department, we often treat those concussed patients symptomatically, treat their vomiting, treat their pain, um, and we do observe them over sort of a four to six hour period, and most will be back to normal um, and uh, be feeling well enough to be discharged home, and thus the CT scan can be avoided. But of course, if those symptoms really persist or worsen over the time of the observation, a CT scan would be done. This is one other study that um, we wanted to mention, and again, this algorithm is also included in the guidelines. And this is a this is a study that it's good to know about because um, they really did an incredible job of collecting this data. Um, it was published in the Lancet in 2009. This is a group out of uh, Davis, uh, the University of California in Davis, um, and they did a multi-center trial looking at kids with minor head injury in the United States and had 42,000 kids in the study. So they derived a clinical decision rule and then validated it. Um, basically answering the question, when do we not have to CT? And so they developed two algorithms, one for kids under two years of age and one for kids over two years of age. And this study is um, good to know about, especially because they had over 10,000 little kids under two years of age. And that really is a hard group to deal with because they are preverbal. And so again, they developed an algorithm looking at whether if the GCS is 14 or there's signs of change in mental status or a palpable skull fracture, if you answer yes to this, the child has up to a 4.5% risk of having a clinically important traumatic brain injury, so they should have a CT. If you answer no to the first box, you move down to the second box, and again, we're looking at signs of scalp hematoma, prolonged loss of consciousness, a severe mechanism, which in this study was, uh, for this age of child, would be a fall over three feet, or being a passenger in a car that was a high risk or uh, um, high rate of speed or rollover or ejection. Somebody was ejected from the car, so a very significant um, car accident, getting hit by a, as a pedestrian or a cyclist uh, with no helmet. And then the other piece with these little kids is that the, if the parent says they're still not acting normally, that's significant. 
If you say no to those things, it's very unusual for them to have a clinically important traumatic brain injury, and thus a CT is not recommended. If you say yes, we move over into an observation versus CT box, just as the one that you saw with um, the Canadian Pediatric Society. And I won't go into more detail around this, but suffice it to say there's another algorithm for the kids over two years of age with some differences in the factors that we look at, but you would move through the algorithm in the same way deciding. So now I'll hand it over to Nick and we'll talk a little bit more about counseling. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So now that we've landed on the diagnosis, we've ruled out uh, other potential issues, other more serious brain injuries, other more internal issues that we may pick up on the CT scan. Uh, what do we do now? So how do we manage this injury? What information can we provide these patients and their families to make sure that they approach their next week, the next two weeks, the next who knows how long uh, in the most appropriate way to get them back doing all the things they need, want, and love to do in their lives. I think that's what we really are trying to do is make sure these kids are safe and make sure they're engaged as much as possible in all the things that they love to do. So I'm going to walk you through some of the um, portions of the guideline that you can access to really give you some idea around what tools and resources and direction can you use in order to, to do exactly this. Um, so first rule of thumb, our mantra, we use this all the time, and I'm sure many of you have, uh, have heard and even said this, when in doubt, sit them out. So we need to make sure that, again, going back to that idea of conservative management, these are kids with a lot of life ahead of them, with a lot of great experience that, experiences that they will be, um, you know, it, that will occur within their, within their lifetime, and we want to make sure they can do that. So, you know, oftentimes the young athletes that I work with, and even their parents sometimes are, are even worse than the athletes, they really want that kid getting back into the game or into that risky um, activity. And what we need to do is just take a step back and, and, say, and counsel that family on the risks involved in that and what could occur from a positive side if we do take this management process step by step and really make sure that, that we're dealing with this injury appropriately. So when we think about the clinical management in the past, and some of you may have uh, been right in this and experienced it yourselves, but we really had a tale of two extremes. Um, and that first being this, the extreme end of take a few days off, it's just you had your bell rung, you know, have some Tylenol and get back to doing all the things that you need to do without much counseling additional to that. The other extreme side, which we've seen more recently, is this idea of, apologize, I'm on a bit of delay with my, with my uh, transition of the slide. So that other extreme is this idea of bedroom jail. Um, and this is, you know, I, I like to call it this because we're really telling these young kids that they can do absolutely nothing until their symptoms go away completely and they're feeling 100%. So they're locked in the room in a dark space without any social interaction, without anything that's really important in their lives uh, until they're feeling better. So the difficulty here is, yes, that, that initial rest, and I'll speak to this as we move through these next few slides, that initial rest in the first few days is, is really going to be key to really allow for that, uh, that ability to conserve energy in the early stages, that ATP, that, that pathophysiology that Sarah, Sarah mentioned. It's really key. but oftentimes there are going to be kids, about 20% or so, that aren't going to recover very quickly. So if you're sitting in your bedroom for one week, for two weeks, for three weeks, and the kids that I end up seeing in my clinic, oftentimes for six months, a year, a year and a half, two years, not doing much at all, what is that doing to that young person? And what is that doing to their family unit? Uh, and we need to make sure we're considering that and really aiming for a common medium between these two extremes. So today our general approach when it comes to clinical management is, is a gradual progression towards activities. Um, so you know, initially in the early stages we're going to have that young person stop playing, studying, working, uh, and really take that initial uh, rest that's going to be so beneficial for their brain and body. We want them to seek that immediate medical advice and, and just as Sarah mentioned, we want to make sure we're ruling out anything more significant and we're getting that good initial education information to the family um, so that they can deal with the injury um, you know, quite effectively if they have that information. And then we want these kids to rest and rest some more, at least initially. Again, I, we want to avoid this idea of prolonged bedroom jail, but we do want that brain and body to conserve as much energy as possible to heal that injury. 
and make sure by the end of the day that young person is feeling uh, not worse and they're feeling quite well and we can continue to progress towards recovery. And then we want to gradually return to activities once those symptoms have started to subside. Uh, and this includes school, work, social life, family, and then the last portion, which I'll speak to as we move along here, is this idea of sports. So really trying to create a, a progression to activities that is starting with less risky environments where you have more control and then moving to uh, those more risky environments that you don't have as much control about on what's going to happen. Uh, I've peppered in a few uh, resources into these next few slides as well. This is something that you can all take a look at and you can pass on to your own social networks, professional networks, your clients, your patients, your families that you work with. Uh, and this is a new video by uh, Dr. Mike Evans. Um, it's on concussion management and returning to learn. And it's a YouTube video that anyone can access for free. And it does a really great job of breaking down what a concussion is and what you can do in order to manage that injury and get back specifically to the school environment. Um, so this video, uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in some of the content uh, development. And there are some fantastic experts from many different stakeholder groups, health professionals, um, parents, schools, that type of thing, to really inform uh, something that's sticky, that's easy to access, that, that kids and families can really buy into. So I, I encourage you to take a look at this great video and, uh, and see if you can incorporate it into your own practice. Um, so now I'm going to get right into um, some screenshots from the guideline itself to give you a little bit more direction on what the consensus was from all this, this mass process in putting these guidelines together and how we can all use the direction appropriately within our own uh, within our own worlds. So first we want to consider this idea of on discharge. So we've diagnosed the injury, we've ruled out that there isn't uh, more significant uh, issues going on within the brain uh, and within the body and what are we going to do next. Um, so I'm hoping you guys can see it. I'm still on a delay but I'm going to progress to just to see. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that we're providing the verbal information and written handouts to our child uh, and their families. Uh, we want to inform on the expected course of recovery and return to play and learn. We want to advise on the risk of complications. Oh, sorry, we're progressing here. I'll go back to that slide for everyone. And, and we want to work through the necessary steps throughout that recovery process. Um, the one great part about this guideline that you can all access um, so it's currently in a PDF format. We are moving towards different methods to disseminate the knowledge uh, more directly. But in its current state, you can click on the numbers that you see listed in the, in the far left column, and it will take you directly to that section of the guideline to give you those tools and resources that you can use to directly address that, that area of care. So when it comes to acute treatment, um, we do know that we want that physical and cognitive rest, as I mentioned initially. We want to do the best we can on treating the, the symptoms, and headaches is going to be a big one. Uh, but we can also try to minimize those environmental um, uh, uh, pieces that are going to exasperate symptoms. So if it's sunlight or noisy situations, uh, we can try to min minimize that. And even from, uh, and this is where I put on my occupational therapist hat, thinking from uh, just managing the environments that we're doing things in. So some environments are going to be very busy and distracting and difficult for us to manage, and others are going to be much more quiet and easier for us to do what we need to do. So keep that in mind when we're counseling uh, our patients. Um, sleep is going to be a big issue. We want that brain to rest as much as possible, and a great time to do that is during sleep. We want to manage fatigue wherever we can, and we want to make sure we're promoting good hydration and nutrition. We all know, for all of us, at the end of a day where we haven't eaten enough and we haven't had enough water in our, put enough water in our body, we feel pretty run down, and we want to avoid that for these kids as much as we can. So I'll walk you through some of the specific sections of the guideline uh, and direct you towards some of the tools that you can access for each of these areas of uh, management after the injury. And this first is this idea in section 3.1 of the guideline, um, speaking to providing verbal information and written handouts. Um, so just giving as much information and good information to the families and the youth themselves as we can. Um, so right now in our world, we all sort of get a diagnosis or we think there's something wrong with us and we immediately go online and we 
sift through all the, the millions of websites and information that's out there. What we were really trying to do with these guidelines is make sure that good information is readily available and we vetted all of the other uh, information to make sure that what we're passing on to our, to our patients and their families is really good stuff and stuff that they can use effectively. Um, so within that red box you can see on the slide, these are some of the tools that you can access and these are freely available. You click on that link uh, and it will bring that tool right up. So um, tools related to letters of accommodation for school, um, others return to school plans and so on. And I'll, I'll speak to some of the other tools as we move along here. The next um, section that I want to speak to briefly is this idea of really informing the patient and their family on expected outcome. So of the limited research specific to youth uh, with concussion, we do know that providing good information around that recovery is possible um, and these are the steps that you have to take to, to make sure that you have a, a positive outcome after your injury, it goes a really long way. So we want to make sure that we're providing this information um, immediately or as quickly as possible um, to our clients and families to get them uh, the good info that they can use. Uh, I'll tell you, if I had a, sorry, a nickel for every family that comes to me six months, a year after their injury and says, I wish I had this information uh, right off the bat, you know, I'd, be a, I'd be a rich man. And, and that's a problem. We need to make sure we're doing a better job giving people good information uh, quickly. So it's really key to make sure um, that there's verbal reassurance around the symptoms that are expected and common and that these symptoms come in ebbs and flows and we need to be aware of that and that there is an expectation for positive recovery. The brain is resilient, it wants to recover, but we need to give it a chance to do so. So along those lines related to expected recovery, we do see, at least in the adult literature, that symptoms typically resolve after a concussion within seven to 10 days. Um, what we do know is that these data are a little less clear in kids. And as I mentioned previously, it can take much longer for these young kids to, to recover from their injury and we need to be fully aware of that. So until we have more literature to, to support the time frame to recovery, we need to build in more time for these kids to, to recover and we need to give their families uh, reasonable expectations on when this recovery will occur. Uh, I, I find often that if we're always going with the adult data and saying to these families that, you know, you should be feeling better within 10 days, and, and the kids aren't because it's just not as possible within, within the youth brain and the youth population, it becomes really frustrating. And, and if we have unrealistic expectations laid out for the families in advance, that recovery process becomes very difficult for the young person to manage. We also want to make sure that we're really focusing on this idea of physical and cognitive rest. And oftentimes in the sport world, we see this tunnel vision around well, I was injured playing hockey, so I'm going to avoid playing hockey, but I'm going to do everything else in my life um, at full steam ahead. And we need to make sure that there are, there is education and, and tools and resources available to our, to our families and our clients and our patients to let them know that physical and cognitive rest is essential and this is how you can do it. So generally, we do look at that initial 48-hour period as a time when complete rest is, is, can be extremely effective. Um, but there is new literature coming out that we're, we're all working on as a collective across Canada and the U.S. as well, speaking to when is it good to start engaging in activity, even if there are some symptoms um, there. So our, our mantra right now is we do want an initial period of rest, um, but we don't want to have bedroom jail for weeks and weeks and weeks because we know it can most likely do more harm than good. And again, if you click on the, the, the links when you do visit the guideline, you can access some fantastic tools that really walk the families and the, and the youth themselves through the recovery process and give them all the tools necessary to self-manage to the best of their ability. We also want to make sure that we're advising on the risks for re-injury. Um, and as I mentioned before, we want to really set the stage for let's get these young people taking part first in activities of lower risk uh, where there is more control um, in that environment that they're participating in and progressing them gradually to, to activities of, of less 
control and of more risk. So we want to make sure that we're not putting these young kids in an environment where they can have a second injury before that first one is healed because in that situation we can have some really significant brain um, injury occurring and it, and it can even be fatal and we want to make sure that we're avoiding that at all costs. A big piece to the recovery picture is this idea of sleep. Um, if we can promote good sleep habits, um, oftentimes that gas tank that is running on empty can use that evening session of a good sleep um, to, to refill. And when it refills that tank, there's more energy and resources available, one, to get through the day, so to get through all the things that that young person needs to do in, in their life, but also more energy available to heal that injury, which is something we definitely want to happen. The more energy available for healing, the quicker that recovery process is going to be. So within the guideline itself, there's a few um, excellent sections that really break down step by step some of the tools and resources and actions that young people can take and their families can take to really promote healthy habits in life, um, sleep, nutrition, um, those types of things. I won't go into them in too much detail, but I do want you to walk away knowing that these guidelines do break it down in really great detail and you can use this information to guide your practice and to educate your, your patients uh, uh, throughout the management of their recovery. So here we're thinking about healthy habits for sleeping. So sleep hygiene, how are we going to make sure that these kids are sleeping well? As well around um, nutrition and making sure our lifestyle is uh, one that's going to promote healthy sleep habits and healthy, healthy um, opportunities to refill that gas tank and have as much energy as possible. And as well speaking specifically to the environment that, that sleeping is occurring in. So, you know, do we want uh, distractions in that environment? No. Do we want to have, uh, you know, one thing that I like to say to the kids all the time, I always say, where do you do your homework after, you, after you've had an injury? And oftentimes they'll say, well, I do most of my homework in, in my bedroom. And, and what I like to say is let's keep that bedroom for sleeping, for relaxing, and not have you thinking about all those stressful activities from school. So just really considering the environment for sleep is a, a really big factor. We also want to make sure, and it's, it's laid out within the guideline itself, on advising on coping with fatigue. So fatigue is a, is a really big issue, and it's one of those things where the kids may be feeling quite well, and then they get back into school, or they get back into socializing with their friends, and they just start to feel really run down. So we want to make sure that we're providing good information and tools and resources to let them know how to manage that fatigue, how to identify those triggers that are going to cause the fatigue, and how to avoid those situations that are going to make these young people feel like worse at the end of the day. One way of advising on this area, I, I like to, to speak to this idea of energy conservation. So again, that gas tank analogy, there's only so much fuel in that tank, especially when we've had an injury, there's less fuel, but we need to do different activities throughout the day. So how do we prioritize, how do we use that fuel to the best of our ability so we have some left in the tank? And I call it the four Ps. So the first being this idea of prioritizing our activities. What are you going to do? You can't do everything, but what activities are the most important to you or what do you really need to do um, this week, this day, this month in order to, to use that, that energy most efficiently? The other is this idea of planning. So when are you going to do these activities? Um, are you going to be doing them in the morning when you feel best or are you going to be doing them in the afternoon after a hard day when you're feeling worse? Um, those types of things. Also planning rest and relaxation is really key and something that's often overlooked in the, in the youth community. Um, pacing is the next one. So we can't do everything all the time. We need to pace ourselves as we go throughout these activities. And the last being, again, tapping into that idea of environment, positioning ourselves in environments that aren't going to use up resources unnecessarily. Um, one thing that's really great about this approach to conserving energy after injury is this doesn't have to be specific to concussion. So oftentimes I use the concussion with my patients as an excuse to, to put some of these practices into place to help them uh, succeed in school and to work towards university. And, and the nice part as well is usually the parents really buy into this too and start to think, how am I going to do my activities across my day better so I feel uh, not as run down at the end of the day? So it can end up being quite a, a nice family event. We also want to advise uh, 
the families on maintaining social networks and interactions. Again, that idea of bedroom jail, if they're not engaged in their, in their social communities, um, we can have some secondary issues that we definitely don't want to see and don't want to have to manage. So we want to make sure we're promoting healthy recovery and avoiding social isolation and the potential mental health issues that come along with it. And finally, we want to definitely touch on this idea of advising the, the youth on following a stepwise return to learn and return to activity. Uh, and I apologize, guys. I'm on a delay here, so I hope you see the slide that I'm speaking to right now. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing the tools and resources necessary to, to allow these young kids to do this. Um, the stepwise return is absolutely essential. We want to make sure that these youth can manage their, their activities um, at, at levels of lower activity before progressing to, to activities that are too risky or too uh, cognitively or physically demanding. Uh, and by following a stepwise approach, that can be a really nice way to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is pass it back over to Sarah, and she's going to touch on some of the specific tools um, that, that youth and their families and you as healthcare professionals and providers can use directly to help manage that return to activity process after concussion. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, so when we look under 4.1, we'll just stay on this slide for a moment. I just wanted to to orient you to the fact that in the guidelines with with respect to return to learn and return to play, um, where everyone can agree that physical and cognitive rest is the answer, but as as Nick mentioned, the ideal duration has not really been well um, um, delineated to date. So they, with with both of those um, issues, return to learn and return to play, two. Um, types of approaches are advocated. Type Approach A, which is kind of more standard, and approach B, which would be a bit more prolonged and more conservative. Um, and so there are tools for each type. And so you can see on this slide that uh, the A tool is the ACE post-concussion gradual return to school, and the B is um, the Canchild version, which is um, out of McMaster. So we're, um, I just wanted to orient you to that issue. But specifically related to um, uh, return to um, learn, you know, initially within the first three days of the injury, we can see that these are just the general recommendations. So we're doing the, our physical and cognitive rest, once symptom-free, a gradual return. So these are things you've heard before in some of the um, guidelines that have come out around pediatric concussion in the past. Um, if they're um, symptomatic, um, there's a delay to return to activities. Three to six days after the injury, if they re remain symptom-free, they gradually get back to their academic or school-related activities. And this is one of the things that I think really in the last couple of years has come out um, around pediatric concussion is that the return to school must precede the return to play. And our goal is really getting these kids back to their to the, to school. Um, and that's something that you don't hear about, obviously, when you're talking about adults. Um, uh, if the symptoms are um, improving but they worsen with cognitive activities, then the recommendation is that the child does not return to school as yet. If it's been one week or more since the injury and the child is still symptomatic, that's when we need to start thinking about this individualized return to learn accommodations. And in the guidelines, we have lots of tools to help caregivers um, uh, know what those accommodations might be. And the other issue, really important to have a very good um, communication between the school and the parents and caregivers and the, the healthcare provider to support this relearn to, return to learn process. And one important issue that we see in the guidelines that is highlighted, and I think all of us as healthcare providers, if we deal with kids in our practice, we know that a prolonged absence from school can make return to school extremely difficult for the child for lots of different reasons. And so we want to avoid keeping the child out for that prolonged period of time, similar to this the bedroom jail um, concept that Nick was talking to earlier, I think. So this is just to give you an example of the more standard or A-type tool for the return to school. So this is from ACE in the States. Um, and so we see down our left-hand side in the first column, the stages between zero and five the description from no return and the child resting at home all the way to full return to school with no supports. What's happening in each scale, in each um, stage with respect to activity level 
and what would need to happen or in order for the child to move on. So very clearly delineated, a great handout to provide to parents. We won't go through this one in much detail, but this is the much more conservative approach that's advocated um, from CanChild, one of the other tools. This is one that w requires quite a, it's a very slow return to school. This might be a tool you would use for a child you're more concerned about, a child who's had a previous um, injury, um, a child who's having a lot of difficulty, or a lot of symptoms. You may decide to choose this more conservative return to play. Again, a tool that's available on the guidelines, a nice handout for parents. Just to highlight some of the other things that make life a bit easier for busy healthcare providers, in the guidelines we have a template letter of accommodation that this, the physician can print out and then fill in the blanks related to their per, um, particular patient, checking off what things need to be provided by the school in order to accommodate the child getting back to learn. Likewise, there is another return to school activities concussion care plan that's um, provided by Hall and Bloor View, where uh, Nick works. And maybe Nick, do you want to speak to this document? How, how do you find that works for your patients? Yeah, sure. So again, working in a very busy, dynamic environment where you don't have a lot of time to, uh, you know, you want to see as many clients and families as possible, and you don't necessarily have the time to sit down and write individualized letters. This is a, a tool that we developed to, to keep things a little more um, one standard but also more efficient. So we use this checklist as a means to, uh, as a adjunct to any potential need for uh, writing letters for return to school. And we check off and, and personalize the, uh, the return to school plan as best we can for the families and provide it to them and they take it to the school and generally it works quite well. Great, thank you. Um, and for those of us that are out um, in the community and might not have um, a lot of experience advocating these um, different types of accommodations in the guidelines. Um, they include um, some, uh, the next couple of slides I'll just show you, just to give us a little bit of um, guidelines in terms of what kind of accommodations might be considered. And this is, these are documents that um, come from the Canadian Pediatric Society, but are also included in the guidelines um, that were published by ONF. Um, and so the whole, this table too goes through the graduated return to learn protocol, just in general to give us an idea of what initially we're doing cognitive rest all the way to increase school attendance and then once symptom free, then we start our return to play. This is something that having taught con about concussion for quite a number of years, um, that this return to learn before return to play protocol is much more explicitly stated now in the last couple of years, I think really, really important for us. Um, the, um, as healthcare providers who are looking after kids. So this is what I was getting at in terms of, you know, if you weren't really sure what accommodations you might pr um, provide or suggest to the school, you can um, look at this table again from the Canadian Pediatric Society, looking in our first column, what kind of symptoms the child may be having difficulty with, and then suggestions around accommodation for those. So for example, um, a child who's um, having difficulty with their concentration, um, and that uh, gives them a hard, has, you know, they give, have a hard time focusing on their schoolwork. Well, we can ask the school to say, you know, maybe shorter assignments, um, decrease the workload a bit, give frequent breaks, um, allow them a bit more time to complete assignments or tests, um, giving them a place that's quiet where they can concentrate. So these types of um, um, nice suggestions for the healthcare provider as to what they can um, ask the school to provide for the child to get them back um, into the school environment. So I've said this before, but again, the return to play happens after the return to learn. Um, and again, there's an A and a B recommendation. Um, the A tool is from Parachute, um, a Canadian organization that um, provides a more standard return to play um, guideline that you may have heard about before. Um, the B tool is from CanChild, again, um, a slower return to activities and a more conservative approach that you, would, you may elect to use for a child you're more worried about or who has more significant symptoms. So just a screenshot of what that parachute document looks like. So again, available via hyperlink on the website, um, on the PDF, sorry, for the, the concussion guidelines that you can just print out. Uh, nice handout for the parents. And then again, this is the document from CanChild that provides a more conservative return to play. So I'll move along to, back to Nick for your stairs here, Nick. Right. So I know we're uh, we're running short on time a little bit, and we do want to save some time for for questions if possible. So 
I, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on the next few slides, but what I do want you to take away from is this idea that it is a gradual process, and through the guidelines you have the tools and resources that you can provide um, to your clients and their families, but also use to inform your own practice to make sure that this process is gradual. Um, I like to speak in analogies with the kids. It seems to stick a little bit. Um, so I always say, look, if you're going to rush through this return to activity protocol, um, chances of falling down that staircase are much higher. But if you take your time and get a solid footing at each stage, chances of getting to the top and staying there are a whole lot higher, and that's what we want them to do. Um, Quickly, before I pass it back to Sarah, again, return to play, it's a gradual process. The keys here are thinking about medical assessment at different stages within this process, and all of the tools and resources around return to play in the guidelines that you can access will speak to this process. And finally, from my end, speaking of this idea of cognitive rest, again, just getting to that point that everything we do in our day uses activity, cognition, as well as physical activity, and we need to make sure that these kids can handle their school life, their social life, their family life before we even get them back to, uh, to the sporting world. Uh, because if they can't handle those things, we're just putting them at further risk by putting them into a competitive sporting environment. So I'll pass it over to Sarah to finish off, and then hopefully we have a chance for um, some discussion and some questions. Yeah, and so as Nick alluded to, our last or final um, kind of after we made the diagnosis and ruled out more significant injury and counseled the family, we want to plan for serial assessments to help a lot, help and assess the kid as as they're they're getting better. And so in the guidelines, we have a nice table for what needs to happen on an interim assessment. And we've gone through a lot of these things already in terms of our counseling around return to learn and play, and uh, talking to the kids who've had multiple concussions. Um, uh, referring them to an expert in sport concussion to help with returning to play or retirement issues. Um, and those two assessments, at least, you know, uh, that are included on this return to play graphic, you know, the child should be assessed and diagnosed initially, so that's one. They need to, they are, the recommendation is that they do have a medical assessment when they're moving from complete rest to some light exercise and that they would have a third or um, uh, assessment when they move to full contact training. So really the recommendation is, is that these children are seen on multiple occasions by their healthcare provider to ensure that things are going the right way um, and that um, the plan is working. Just a couple of slides about persistent post-concussive symptoms. This is a term that's used to describe as persistent um, concuss um, concussion symptoms that can be in a variety of domains that you see there that are lasting more than one month and generally that term is used to describe a child who's got at least three or more symptoms going on over one month and we know there are some um, good evidence from my colleague who I work with uh, Rogers Emick at CHEO um, that this has a significant impact on their quality of life and it affects their school performance and social engagement um, and so, so um, you know, at, at this point, we have some idea about what are some of the factors that may put a child at risk of having persistent symptoms, and I've alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, there may be things around their symptoms at the time of the injury. Um, it seems that there is a sex-based difference, and girls seem to be at increased risk, um, whether they have these comorbidities that we alluded to earlier or they've had a previous injury. Um, but to be honest, we don't really know, and at the initial visit, we can't predict who's going to have a hard time and who isn't. But I just wanted to let you know that um, my colleague at uh, CHEO, as I mentioned, Roger Zemek, is, um, has undertaken a pan-Canadian study looking at this very question um, and uh, trying to predict and derive a decision rule around some of the things that we can assess on an initial assessment in order to be able to counsel a family a little bit more effectively around whether their child is at an increased risk of having prolonged symptoms and whether that's a kid that we need to get more services in place earlier on um, in order to optimize their recovery. And so keep your ears to the ground. That study will be um, closing and finished at some point, probably in the next, I'd say, 12 to 18 months um, with results coming out. So keep your ear to the ground. That's going to be very interesting. Um, so again, for the kids who are having symptoms over one month, the recommendation in the guideline is that those children are referred to a sports um, specialist or concussion specialist to help 
um, continue to manage their return to learn and return to play. And there are lots of recommendations in the gui guidelines around what types of services and supports you might put in place with a child who has persistent symptoms. So those were our five things that we wanted to talk to around our goals after injury. And, and uh, we were going to uh, finish with some questions that we hear a lot. Um, we've talked to the fact that with the loss of consciousness, you don't need a loss of consciousness in order to make this diagnosis. We know that no matter how expensive the helmet was and the mouth guard, that the concussion can still happen. And we know for sure that our injured player can't play in the tournament this weekend and even his math test is off the books because we need to advocate for our cognitive and our physical rest. So we thank you very much and we are hopefully have almost 10 minutes now to have a bit of a chat and some more questions. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you, guys. Great presentation. We do have a few questions uh, lined up here. Uh, this first question came in from Julie early, early on in the presentation. and. Uh, uh, she's asking, she's, she's commenting from the perspective of someone who's a trainer for a team. I'm also the trainer for my seven-year-old's hockey team. And she's asking about how to assess on the bench and should they return to play in that game. I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned this specifically at the beginning, but I'm assuming these guidelines are for healthcare practitioners, not for the person, the parent with the trainer certificate that, that's sitting on the, uh, the bench of their hockey team. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a lead here on Sarah, and you can chime in if you want. So definitely these guidelines, they're, they're designed for healthcare pr practitioners, but also for community and sport organizations and for, um, you know, for parents themselves. But what we do want to stress is that we do not, we, we definitely want healthcare providers giving that diagnosis and providing that initial information. I think being involved in minor sports myself as a lacrosse coach for the last 15 years and playing my entire life, you know, I've been in that situation as well where you sort of, you feel that sort of pressure to take out a SCAT tool and make a diagnosis and say if that kid can keep playing. My thought is from the trainer's perspective, if you feel the need to, to assess that child for a concussion, remove them from play and send them to the healthcare practitioner. Uh, I think that's the best approach. Sarah, did you want to, did you want to, add to that? No, I, I absolutely agree. The, you, but I would um, just highlight, as Nick mentioned, that if you go to the website where the guidelines are located, you'll see that it's, chap it's chaptered based on who the end user is. So there's three different um, sort of streams to choose from, um, as Nick mentioned. So healthcare provider, and that's really what we were focusing on today, but also then um, school and community organizations and um, parents. So, so um, if that's an interest of yours, that would be a great um, thing to take a look at what um, recommendations are from the, the school and community organization perspective. Yep. All right, thanks. Um, the next question that came in uh, was from Maya, and uh, she's asking uh, when you had, the, I believe it was in the um, Near the, near the end of the presentation, see, when you were talking about uh, return to full contact in sports and the requirement of a, a final sort of medical clearance, she's asking who is providing that final medical clearance? Is it a physician, nurse practitioner, physiotherapist? Uh, Sarah, I'll, I'll go for it on here, Sarah, if you want. So generally what we want, that final clearance decision, we want it to come from a physician. Um, and that's, that's the intention. We want to make sure that there's been proper medical uh, management throughout the, the injury. And there's definitely going to be other healthcare providers involved in the process, including occupational therapists, physiotherapists, athletic trainers, athletic therapists, whatever it may be. But we do want those final decisions to be coming from, uh, from a medical provider, from the physician, and, and most optimally a physician that's been involved in the care from, from the get-go. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting when I, I give workshops on concussion to healthcare providers, I, you know, my sense is at this um, juncture that, that those serial assessments aren't happening that much, and that may be related to it's difficult to get the family back into the office. Um, it may be you know, related to time issues with the, the phys physician themselves, but that's something I think we really need to do a better job on. Uh, Kristen is asking a question, uh, and she's asking, if uh, looking for a diagnosis or treatment for a, con for a concussion, how can we make sure that the healthcare professional is qualified to treat the child? That's a, you know, it's a very good question. Um, it's, you know, ideally, I think what you want to be aiming for is, 
you want to go into those situations with your healthcare provider with, with a certain set of questions. And you can use the guidelines to help do that, to give you a sense of, you know, can this healthcare provider answer the questions that I'm asking based on what is presented within the guidelines themselves? I think uh, the safest bet, and it's always not, I know it's not possible geographically depending on where you are, but oftentimes uh, you do want to try to align yourselves with um, pediatric rehabilitation or, or, or hospital-based services. Uh, and also sometimes the sports medicine physicians will be much more aware of the guidelines and the, the return to the sport aspect and hopefully the return to learn aspect of managing the injury. Um, and they may have just had a whole lot more experience with concussion than, than some of the general practitioners. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that has to date been our referral pattern that for um, in my practice, I'm, I'm making the initial um, diagnosis, but I'm not seeing the patient again. So um, for higher level elite athletes, I generally do refer them to sports med because I think that they have a different, um, they may have a, you know, more significant um, issues related to, you know, getting them back to play and maybe a bit more pressure coming from um, that side of things. Um, patients who've had recurrent concussions, for sure, I refer to sports med. Um, and I've, I've, talked about concussion in, in various locations even I was up uh, in northern Ontario in pretty small communities in the last couple of weeks and um, they endorsed the practitioners there did endorse they also had sports med follow-up and that was their um, referral pattern too so I think that that's definitely an option for a healthcare provider who's not super comfortable with this issue all right uh, the next question, and we do have about two minutes left, so if you do have any other uh, last-minute questions, please start uh, typing them in now. But the last question we have in the uh, in the hopper right now is from Laurel, and she's asking about driving a vehicle. If someone is uh, asymptomatic for 48 hours, is that enough? Is that long enough to wait before driving a vehicle, or should the wait be longer? Sarah, did you want to try this one? Well, I mean, I think that's a great question, and that that is something that I think that these guidelines are the first to mention driving. Um, which I think we kind of forget about when we're seeing the teenagers. And we know that driving is a very complex activity requiring a significant amount of cognitive demand. Um, and so the recommendation, and perhaps Nick can chime in, but the recommendation would be to lay off that until they're able to manage pretty, you know, that they're cognitively back to a level where they're going to be able to sustain their attention and their focus. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that in the guideline, Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if it specifically talks about when they can return to drive, but there's definitely, it's highlighted that driving initially should be um, um, avoided. Yeah, and, and I would agree. And I think it goes back to that idea of, you know, less risky, less involved activities before you start to progress to more involved and more risky activities. With driving being a very, as Sarah mentioned, a very complex task, we want to make sure that if possible, we can use our resources and our energy on other activities and hopefully have someone drive us to our appointment or wherever we need to go. Microphone muted. <laughs> uh, Laurel uh, put in a follow-up asking about uh, traveling in an airplane. Do you have any recommendations about traveling in an airplane? I shouldn't answer this because I don't like to fly, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you know anything that's going to tax that system is something that we want to try to avoid at, at all costs if we can. And I think for any of us, air, air travel is, is a taxing activity, right? So we generally feel dehydrated after. We generally, you know, there could be headaches, there's noise, there's different activities. It's usually really noisy and busy in the airport. So um, just from a, a, a less scientific answer, I think in general, it's a, it's a pretty tough thing to do for any of us on any day. And if you're dealing with concussion symptoms and trying to conserve that energy as best as possible, probably not the best thing to do. All right. Uh, we do have another question coming that came in from Richard, and he's asking, as a volunteer first responder who provides pre-hospital care for alpine skiers, they see anywhere up to a dozen concussions every weekend. He said, parents and coaches may disbelieve or refute the suggestion of a concussion in their child. Any advice on dealing with the parents and coaches that don't believe that there is a concussion? 
Yeah, and this is this is what we're up against, the culture. And it's really tough, and I see it, you know, even on the kids that I've coached, I've coached the same kid group of kids from when they were seven all the way through till they're 17, and we still run up against this every season. Um, I think, the honestly, the best thing to do is try and go back in time, take a step back, and do the best we can to educate as many people within our organization as possible. So whether it's preseason or at the end of the, whatever it may be, but try to get every parent, every coach, everyone involved in that organization uh, to attend a really thorough concussion education session that's going to allow everyone to be on the same page and hopefully help to avoid some of those situations where um, people are potentially putting their kids at, at risk for further injury, which is something we all can't do. Yeah, I mean, and one other message that I try and, you know, when the, the kid may be denying and saying, no, I'm fine to go back, uh, parents may be saying the same thing, um, you know, I think it's uh, talking to them about sort of immediate issues around, you know, if you go back too early, you're at a much higher risk of having another injury and you, you may end up being out for the season rather than out for, you know, a shorter period of time, a few weeks. Um, and that, that I find does tend to resonate, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I find that actually I don't run into that um, difficulty. I'm probably seeing a very different population than what you see out on a ski hill because obviously people have selected to come in to see me generally. But um, I think that pointing to some of these higher profile cases of concussion have, has really, really helped um, because people, all you have to do is mention Sidney Crosby and, and parents nod, you know, they, they um, so that some of that media exposure has actually really helped to shift um, a little bit towards a more acceptance of this injury mm -hmm. and a recognition of how significant and serious it can be. It's a shame to say, but it, the best thing that happened to concussions was probably that Sidney Crosby got one. That's certainly, I think, what raised the profile for most of us around the country. But. <laughs> Um, so that's the last question that we have. Um, so I think we'll try and wrap it up now. So I'll just hand it back over to you, uh, Nick or uh, Sarah, uh, for any final closing comments that you'd like to leave the audience with. Sure. So I just want to thank everyone for attending today. I think we're, as you can tell, we're quite passionate and excited about these guidelines, finally having something that we can standardize our approaches across healthcare providers, families, sport organizations. And so we're thrilled to, to have this tool, and now we just need to get it into the hands of the people who can use it. So um, thank you for, for taking part in today's uh, session, and I hope you, you find the guideline useful and you can uh, incorporate them into your practice. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. We've included some resources. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, I really recommend that you take a look at the guidelines and keep your ear to the ground because we're going to be, as, as Nick mentioned earlier, developing some, um, hopefully, a dedicated website with um, an easy, very easy to navigate um, setup um, in order for these tools to be more in your hand that you can provide to your patients and families. All right. And I also intended to mention at the beginning that we are also working on a more in-depth series uh, on these concussion guidelines where we will be bringing in a number of other speakers and really focusing in on a number of areas uh, of concussion related to these guidelines. And, and I think well, that won't be until after Christmas, uh, probably a few months after Christmas, maybe even closer to the spring. But um, keep your eyes peeled for any information about that because it should be a really, really great informative series where we can really get into the nuts and bolts of these things. So I guess with that, we'll wrap it up. So it's my opportunity to say thanks to uh, Sarah and Nick for, for a great presentation, really timely and relevant content uh, for this audience, for sure, as we can tell by all of the questions that have come in. So thank you uh, both for such a great presentation, and thank you uh, to the audience for joining us. We do these uh, webinars usually every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, for more information, you can always go to our website at cafc.org, and you can go to the CAFC Presents section that you can see up on the screen right now, and we have our list of upcoming webinars. Um, we are heading, as I mentioned, into the CAFC conference coming up, so there will be a couple of uh, weeks where we don't have any, where we're taking a bit of time off while we head out to Calgary. But uh, on the screen, you can also see the, uh, the sign-up page where you can sign up for email notifications for any of, uh, to be informed of any upcoming webinars and to register for the CAFC Presents email newsletter. Um, so if you are interested in hearing more about these webinars, just that's probably the best uh, place to keep informed. So uh, thanks again for, for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Thank you.